I mean, we are seeing the closing of the habitable space. You know, we, we've, we have pushed and pushed planetary systems to such an extent that they're less and less able to support us and much of the rest of life on, on Earth. And we have very little time in which to stop doing that and to repair as much damage as we can before very large parts of the planet become more or less uninhabitable. Yeah, we urgently need to shift. And what we need to shift is not just current practice, but this whole weight of story, this massive great boulder of story, which has accumulated over these thousands of, of years. Today, we welcome back environmentalist and Guardian journalist, George Monbiot, fresh off the back of an Oxford University chaired debate against holistic grazing proponent, Alan Savory. The debate proposition being that livestock grazing is essential to mitigating climate change. Alan in agreement with the proposition and George in opposition. I found the debate fascinating and had several questions of my own. Today's conversation offers a summary of the debate and further insight into George's position. Enjoy. George, you recently debated Alan Savory on whether or not holistic grazing is essential to mitigating climate change. To kick things off here, who is Alan Savory and how did this debate hosted by Oxford University kind of come about? Um, Alan Savory is a Zimbabwean rancher who um, came to fame through a TED talk in which he claimed that cattle ranching could cancel all the carbon emissions which have been produced since the Industrial Revolution and um, withdraw them and bury them in the ground, and uh, that it could restore vast tracts of land in arid parts of, of the world um, by sort of, uh, using particular intensive pulses of cattle grazing. Um, now, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and he produced none in this talk apart from photos, some of which later turned out to be photos showing the opposite of what he claimed. Um, he showed photos of all this lush vegetation rebounding when cattle were brought back onto the land, but actually in some cases that lush vegetation happened when cattle were removed from the land. But the photos weren't marked, they weren't located, they weren't logged, um, there, there was no way of authenticating what he was showing us. Anyway, because of the enormous support that this um, uh, talk generated, um, millions of views, and um, a great deal of lobbying effort getting behind it from the meat industry and the ranching industry, I thought I need to look into this. And I devoted a lot of time, I mean a lot of time, into reading really the entire scientific literature uh, for or against the claims that he was making and found that not only were those claims um, um, completely improbable, but actually there's a great deal of countervailing evidence to show um, that not only can they not possibly be true, but that cattle ranching is among the greatest threats to life on Earth. It's it's the driving force of much of the world's habitat destruction, um, of desertification, and indeed of um, very major greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and um, and I wrote this um, up in various forms. Um, I, I had uh, published a, an article about it quite a long time ago. Then I looked into it even further after um, a documentary called Kiss the Ground was made, which um, uh, made a hero of Alan and his claims. Um, and it was like, unfortunately, so many of these so miracle documentaries. We've got uh, answers to all the world's complex problems right here. Um, it was completely incautious in terms of providing scientific evidence for the claims that it was making. And as a result, it has been extremely misleading. A lot of people have been um, have believed it and have been misled. So um, I updated my research. Um, I then wrote as part of my book, Regenesis, um, a critique of Alan's claims and looking in, in more depth about um, the idea of um, how much and whether you can actually sequester and store carbon in soils and issues such as that. Um, and then Alan challenged me to a debate. And um, he was coming to Britain 
Um, I, I accepted the challenge because I felt I owed it to him to to discuss these things face to face. Um, he proposed a title for the debate, which was very similar to the title that we ended up with, um, is Livestock Grazing Essential to Mitigating Climate Change, I think was the one we ended up with. And it was kindly hosted by Oxford University's Natural History Museum, which incidentally was the site of possibly the most famous scientific debate in history between Thomas Henry Huxley and Bishop Wilberforce in 1860 about evolution. This one um, wasn't nearly so prestigious. Okay, so just to kind of summarise some of that and get everyone up to speed if they're new to this topic, I think most people, George, are aware of the negative effects of animal agriculture on the environment. But when it comes to beef, I think many people have been sold this idea that the problem is not beef, it's how the beef is produced. And that if we move away from intensive animal agriculture, we all have this idea in our head of what that looks like. Um, it's very inhumane practice, lots of cows packed into a small area, a lot of monocrops required to grow uh, feed to feed those animals that contributes to to deforestation. Uh, but what Alan Savory has put forward is a kind of special form of producing beef that we no longer have to kind of feel bad about. We don't have to feel like we're eating this product that's destroying the environment. And the message really, which kiss the ground or sacred cow or alan savory or or wherever you kind of look within that community is that it's not the cow george it is the how and so i think we need to to unpack why this special form of grazing that's being put forward why your position is that it's not scientific and that this claim that holistic grazing is essential to mitigating climate change is not evidence-based. And I like the way in the debate you, you kind of framed this with three criteria, I believe it was, that, that you said if we're going to accept this position of Alan Savory's and the regenerative kind of grazing community at large, then these three criteria need to be met. So maybe we could walk through some of that. Yeah, yeah. So, so – um, in, in order to support this claim that um, livestock grazing could mitigate climate change, let alone is essential to it, which was the motion of the debate which Alan proposed, you would have to meet the following three conditions, as you say. The first is that carbon must be stored in the soil, not, not just cycled through it, because you know we know that in aerated soils, agricultural soils, carbon goes in, but it also goes out um, um, pretty fast often. So it actually needs to be stored in the soil. And you would need to show, meeting proper tests of statistical significance, that that storage is sustained across meaningful time periods. Uh, and, and that storage must be what we call additional, in other words, it wouldn't be happening anyway, verifiable, you must be able to demonstrate that that's really happening, and attributable to the presence of livestock. In other words, you have to show that it is the cows which are responsible for that storage. So that's criterion one. Um, it, it, it has to be, be um, demonstrable, additional, verifiable, attributable. Criterion two is that any carbon storage that you achieve through your um, special ranching technique has to outweigh the current account emissions of the livestock operation. And by current account emissions, that's the sort of daily emissions which are produced uh, by your animals and by your um, um, commercial operations surrounding those animals. So that would include enteric methane, in other words, the methane produced in cow's stomachs, which is um, um, the, the, uh, the uh, um, livestock are, are the world's foremost source of anthropogenic methane, very powerful greenhouse gas. Nitrous oxide, which um, comes particularly from livestock dung, another powerful greenhouse gas. And the carbon dioxide that is produced by your machinery, your feed, your transport, your slaughter, your packing. In other words, any carbon you're storing in the soil 
as well as being demonstrable, attributable, verifiable, etc., has to outweigh any greenhouse gases that you're producing by producing this beef. So that was criterion two. And then the third one is that any carbon storage in the soil also has to weigh what I call the capital account greenhouse losses. And by that, I mean the carbon opportunity costs of not having a wild ecosystem, including wild herbivores, that would otherwise have occupied the same land. And actually, carbon opportunity cost is a huge impact, particularly of extensive livestock keeping. And, and you're quite right. We all hate, and rightly so, intensive livestock operations. They're horrible. They're destructive. They're polluting. They're extremely cruel to the animals. The great majority of our um, livestock products, incidentally, meat and milk and the rest, come from those operations, um, though we like to deny that. And, and a lot of people say, well, the answer then is extensive livestock. But the problem with extensive livestock is it requires a huge amount of land. And that land um, has got an ecological opportunity cost and a carbon opportunity cost. And the opportunity cost is the cost of what you could otherwise be doing if you weren't using it for for purpose X. So in other words, if you're not using it for cattle ranching, that land could be supporting rainforest, for instance, or a rich wild savanna ecosystem or a natural grassland ecosystem, all of which turn out to be much richer in carbon than, um, than the great majority of cattle ranching, and in fact, probably than any cattle ranching. So you would have to demonstrate that you're also outweighing through any carbon sequestration in the soil or carbon storage in the soil, the capital account greenhouse gas losses. In other words, those carbon opportunity costs not having the wild ecosystem. Um, and then you subtract from that because we've got to be rigorous and fair in all this, um, the carbon costs of producing protein by alternative means. So you can compare, you can say, you know, you could get your, uh, you could be eating beef and you've got um, X kilograms of protein being produced by your beef operation. This is a carbon opportunity cost of that. But we've also got to look at the carbon opportunity cost of the protein we might otherwise be eating. Um, and so you subtract that from that. And this net carbon opportunity cost should consist of a combination of below ground carbon and above ground carbon. And both of those should be accounted so those were the criteria. I think they are rigorous and fair criteria. I haven't heard anyone um, come up with a clear critique of what's wrong with those criteria. Um, uh, people seem to accept that those are, are basically what we should be looking for if we are to establish that Alan Savory's claims could be true. And so I use those, I uh, made an exhaustive search looking at those criteria right across the scientific literature. And there is not a single paper anywhere which shows those criteria being met. There is nowhere on earth which has been documented in the scientific literature which ticks those boxes. So Alan's claims simply have no empirical basis. Where do the studies that Alan Savory and, and people within this holistic grazing community typically fall down just listening to those three criteria you know i'm my mind's kind of going to nutrition research at least with the carbon opportunity cost because the carbon opportunity cost gets me thinking about the importance of what you're comparing to and in in nutrition we can we can almost make anything look good if we if we choose the right comparator um so is it that in these studies that alan savory and his colleagues are referring to that they're they're not comparing it to you know all of the possible ways that that land could be used is it that they're not you know properly calculating the amount of carbon that is actually stored versus sequestered where where are these studies falling down with regards to the three criteria here that you've set yeah so they actually fall down on all three of of those criteria um so um for a start, they um, ha have these extremely optimistic projections about storing carbon in, in the soil. Um, and and if you listen to the way they talk about it, you would think you could just store carbon indefinitely in, in the soil. But actually, there's a great deal of evidence to suggest that in um, aerated soils, in other words, agricultural soils, we're talking about soils which aren't waterlogged, 
Um, so, you know, to distinguish it from um, peat bogs, for example, or um, from salt marshes, um, where you can get an accumulation of carbon, you just don't have a sustained accumulation of carbon in aerated soils. They they saturate and saturate pretty quickly, and then they lose as much carbon as 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 they might sequester. So you've got this cycling process where carbon goes in and goes out, but there's not long term storage. In fact, to demonstrate long term storage in in the soil, um, you, you'd have to do that across uh, what you know in any other carbon um, situation are thought of as meaningful time periods and that's at least 20 or 30 years and 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 it's simply not being done in fact even the tools we've got to demonstrate that storage just aren't adequate so for instance loss and ignition which is the main way of of showing what the carbon content of soil is is just not accurate enough to show the kind of incremental additions which people are claiming so that, that we don't even have the right tools to demonstrate that this thing is is supposedly happening, um, and and then um, you, because of in enormous degree of patchiness of variability within one field, you can have a high carbon spike in one place, and you can have almost no carbon in another place. Um, you, you 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 have to do a massive amount of sampling. Um, and you have to be sure that your sampling is absolutely pinpoint accurate so that you're looking at exactly the same place um, from one year to the next. And and we, we simply are not up to be, being able to do this, not on any of the sort of large scale sites which are which which we would need in order to show that this is happening. So so right from the outset. Um, the claims that you're storing carbon in the soil simply can't be validated. And moreover, the the storage capacity of the soil is, is limited, as the great soil scientist Ratan Lal has pointed out, by, um, by, by what that soil would have been like without any human interference. So if you've got a grassland soil, there is a certain amount of carbon that, that soil can, can hold. And the maximum amount is the amount it held before we started messing with that ecosystem, it, a woodland soil similarly, and and and, um, and 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 all the rest of it. So even if you were to um, somehow miraculously restore all the world's grassland soils back to what they once were, because they've got a finite capacity, you wouldn't get anywhere near the amount of industrial emissions. Uh, which Alan Savory says he can cancel out, which is all the emissions ever ever produced since the Industrial Revolution. So, in other words, it's it's to use um, the the rigorous scientific term, it's total bullshit. Wouldn't that soil saturation also? And I'm playing devil's advocate here, but it, say you were to take a, a, some grasslands that were currently being used for for grazing, and you, we restored that system through rewilding to a natural ecosystem that that land would also still reach a, a point of carbon saturation right are you saying that the the issue is here with when you have animals grazing on that over that land over time if you're storing less and less carbon and then you reach a point of saturation the net emissions become greater because those animals are still emitting greenhouse gas emissions is is that the is that the problem here well well no no that's the second problem so so the first problem is that actually you can't store much carbon in the soil um and and uh, even um and and also that sequestration in other words cycling through the soil is not the same as carbon storage you know carbon storage is something you must demonstrate for any useful purposes across 20 or 30 years and 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 people are simply not demonstrating that and in fact they're being paid carbon credits long before we've reached any sort of time period so it, it's effectively fraudulent um and um uh, and so so the i the, the because um it's very hard to demonstrate that you're storing carbon and that saturation is achieved pretty quickly. You've got, there's a very small pool that you can use um, to counteract any of your um, process emissions, your current account emissions, 
or your capital account emissions. So then we get on to problem two, which is that day to day, you're still producing all these greenhouse gas emissions, which are counteracting any amount of, of carbon that you're storing in the soil, which is generally a very small amount if you're storing it at all. Um, and yes, as you rightly say, th those emissions are still being produced. The, the cows are still emitting methane. The dung is still emitting nitrous oxide. The machinery is still emitting carbon dioxide. Um, and it's it's there was a, um, a, a meta-analysis looking at 300 papers around the world, which showed that there is no recorded instance anywhere of a cattle operation or a livestock grazing operation washing its own face in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the, the, the best they ever found in any documented paper was um, um, uh, uh, counteracting 60% of those emissions. And even that is making some pretty heroic assumptions about um, soil carbon storage. And then that's before you get onto the opportunity costs. So what you're saying there is in the best case scenario, if this these uh, holistic grazing systems are sequestering slash storing carbon, which I want to come back to and, and double click on a little more, that because the system is also producing emissions, when you when you look at the net carbon emissions, only 60% 60 of the emissions coming from the practice are being offset by what is potentially stored. But over time, that, that storage capacity is limited. So as time goes on and on and on, your land is less able to store carbon is what I'm hearing, but your practice above the ground still has the same emissions. So the amount of offset is getting smaller and smaller over time, if, I'm, right. if I'm hearing this yeah. and correctly. It, and it rapidly declines to zero, yeah. Yep. So that means if there is any real benefits from greenhouse gas emissions up for grabs, they're somewhat short-lived. Carbon storage versus carbon sequestration, I'm still not 100% clear on this. And sequestration is a term that is being used widely. It's kind of um, flung around here, there, and everywhere. And I know in Australia, Australia, uh, the, the carbon credit programs that you just spoke of, there is a number of these initiatives in Australia claiming to use grazing to draw down carbon, which are then sold as credits to companies like Shell and other entities involved in fossil fuels as a way of offsetting their total annual emissions. And, and you just sort of described some of this as fraudulent or could be fraudulent. Let's, un let's unpack this a little bit more. So the difference between carbon storage and carbon sequestration and why you have a bit of a problem with carbon credit programs. Thank you. Yeah, no, these are all excellent questions. So you're asking exactly the right question. So um, <laughs> there's a generalized problem here in that storage and sequestration are endlessly confused with each other. And this problem is actually, you know, it's a problem everywhere, but in soil science, it's, it's a double problem because they use those terms the opposite way around to how anybody else uses those terms. So if you're talking about forests or if you're talking about geological formations, sequestration is a process of cycling carbon into them and storage means holding on to that carbon. But weirdly, in soil science, they use it the other way around, that um, storage is, is the cycling into the soil and sequestration is the holding, is, is the holding on to it. So it, it's a... Uh, yeah, it's really confusing from the outset. And I've actually uh, begged the soil science community to align their terms with everybody else's terms. Um, but what they say is we've already had such a horrendous fight over what's the difference between storage and sequestration. We just don't want to reopen that issue. So unfortunately, we're stuck with this state of perma-confusion. Um, I would like to advocate strongly that when we say sequestration, we mean the process. And when we say storage, we mean the outcome. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it's it's one of those boxes you just don't want to open. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so for the purposes of this discussion, let's stick to the terms uh, uh, sequestration as process, the, the cycling of carbon through a system, and storage as the desired outcome, the holding onto the carbon um, uh, by that system. Um, and 
Um, and and to demonstrate that is really, really difficult, not least because we currently don't have the tools. Now, as it happens, I'm working with a group of researchers on trying to improve the tools um, for um, uh, assessing uh, um, carbon in the soil. Um, and um, watch this space. We, we, we've got some quite exciting ways forward, we think, because we urgently need to do that, you know, for scientific reasons, but also to help farmers um, uh, and and also to avoid what I see as now a total, the totally fraudulent nature of the, um, the, the, the carbon credit industry, particularly when it comes to soil. I mean, it's just, uh, it's just not demonstrable. You, 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 People are being paid very large amounts of money on the basis that they are storing, holding on to carbon in the soil, and they simply haven't demonstrated that they are doing so. And so you have this totally perverse situation where companies such as Microsoft um, and indeed many others are buying carbon credits from cattle ranchers who are almost certainly inflicting massive greenhouse gas attacks on the living planet. You might as well buy your carbon credits from a coal mine. It's totally perverse. What's going on here? Because in Australia, the the carbon credit programs, at least to some capacity, seem to be seem to be um, not maybe not driven by the government, but the government is involved and in, and in almost advocating for these these programs. Is this just a misunderstanding of? the science by people that are involved in in legislation it's the same in the us it's the same in france we're, we're seeing big government drives to support this nascent carbon credit soil industry um so yeah what exactly is going on well the first thing to say is that um even civil servants government um um operators are human beings and they are swayed by um these very powerful narratives in the media and elsewhere and so some of them doubtless genuinely believe what they're being told by people like Alan and by films like Kiss the Ground, even though, you know, I see this as possibly the world's most successful greenwash operation ever launched. You know, th this is greenwash and, and climate denial on a massive scale. And it's been so successful that I think some government ministers, and in fact, I've come across one or two in my own country and civil servants, genuinely believe that they're doing the right thing but on top of this comes a huge lobbying operation by the meat industry it's latched on to these claims and amplified them massively and then lobbied um, for uh, uh, ranching to be seen as a net benefit uh, for the planet um, and and so has um, sort of thrown its industrial weight behind this uh, utterly fraudulent and fictitious uh, way of accounting for, 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 for greenhouse gas withdrawals. Um, now, what we've seen uh, around the world in a whole lot of other um, fields is the collapse of carbon offset and carbon withdrawal schemes. We, we've seen a whole lot of them ex exposed as effectively fraudulent. Um, most of them so far have been forest carbon schemes where companies have told um, uh, have told well-meaning people, uh, you can offset your emissions by um, buying into this forest conservation scheme of ours, and it turns out that those um, that supposed storage of carbon is not verifiable, um, um, attributable, additional, or all, all those other criteria that we talked about earlier on. Um, there's been a spectacular implosion of a um, ranching carbon sequestration scheme, um, which was uh, pushed in northern Kenya and had very dire social impacts, driving people off, off the land, as well as um, being completely scientifically baseless. But I think these other ranching carbon credits are going to go the same way. One by one, we're going to see them falling over and a whole lot of people um, getting really stung by this because they'll discover that they've been putting their money not only into something which doesn't work, but into something which is actively harmful, which is actually producing more greenhouse gases more rather than fewer greenhouse gases. So why are companies like Microsoft 
buying these carbon credits is it is that something that's been legislated that they they have to or are they doing it to just appear as though they're environmentally friendly to kind of save face and and help from a branding perspective um because when you kind of just zoom back out what you're saying is companies that are responsible for a lot of environmental degradation are making it making it look like they care about the environment but they're really funding a practice that if anything is worsening the state of the environment and and the planet that we're trying to protect even more well every company now wants to say we are carbon neutral or we are carbon negative it's a big selling point you know I buy our products rather than those of our competitors because we're good for the planet and by implication they're bad for the planet and but most companies don't want to actually change their corporate practices. They don't want to change the things that make make their money. And so instead of changing anything, they uh, just slap on this green paint on top of everything they're doing and they greenwash their operations. And one way of doing that is by buying carbon offsets. Now, I'm very skeptical about carbon offsets in general for several reasons, partly because it's just mathematically impossible to offset the amount of emissions that we're producing. Um, and you just have to cut those emissions at source if we're going to uh, um, um, prevent climate breakdown. Uh, but also because um, they're, they're, the moral hazard is very great. It's, it's like a green light to carry on doing whatever you're doing, however damaging it might be, because one day somewhere, somehow, we're going to swallow up those emissions by growing trees or by changing other people's light bulbs or whatever it might be. And I'm not saying that all of these carbon offsets are fraudulent. There are carbon offsets around the world, which I think are genuine. But um, you, if you just keep on burning and burning and burning carbon and producing more and more greenhouse gases, you, there's simply not going to be enough plant planetary capacity to, to swallow up the impacts of what you're doing. Um, and, and so it's just a way of keeping the whole destructive machine rolling. And it's used very effectively by lobbyists to say, don't regulate us. We don't have to change what we're doing because we've got another way of making those carbon emissions disappear. Whereas actually all the evidence shows that we urgently need to regulate these companies. We need to regulate some of them out of existence. I mean, private jets would be a classic example of that. You know, however many offsets a billionaire buys to make up for the emissions from their private jets, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're still a massive polluter. Uh, and we just have to say, sorry, no more private jets. That, that seems an obvious step to take. But offsets are a very good way of avoiding that step. So you said there are some legitimate offset programs. How do we know as a consumer if we're being marketed to or maybe we're buying a plane ticket? You know, often there's a little box there. Do we want to buy yeah, a five dollar yeah. carbon offset? Is that just to make us feel good or are we are we contributing to the environment in, in any way, in a positive way or is there a way for us to work out if that carbon offset is legitimate or fraudulent? I'm afraid at the moment it's really difficult to tell because a lot of the verification companies have been exposed by the implosion of some of these offset schemes as basically verifying stuff which shouldn't have been verified. And the whole offset industry is now in total disarray. Um, a, a lot of people were warning way back this is going to happen. And those warnings were not heeded. Um, so it's very hard now for, for your ordinary consumer who doesn't have a PhD in these things to, to, to work out what actually stands up and, and what doesn't. Um, and I mean, I don't know. Um, I mean, I've, I've never bought an offset because I've tried not to um, create those greenhouse gas emissions in the first place. And I think that is really the only reliable way of doing it. This episode is proudly brought to you by Inside Tracker. Track your blood biomarkers, understand your biological age, and receive personalized lifestyle tips backed by evidence to optimize your health. To get started with Inside Tracker today and get 20% off your first purchase, head to insidetracker.com forward slash Simon. 
That's insidetracker.com forward slash Simon for 20% off. Okay, so we've gone through number one, the storage of carbon being additional, verifiable, and attributable. So the, the science that's being presented, you're saying, falls down here. It also can fall down when we look at number two, so carbon storage, this sort of offsetting or counteracting um, effect. Number three, carbon opportunity cost. What what do we see here when we look at, at studies that people within holistic grazing would cite? What's not being considered when it comes to carbon opportunity cost? The key issue here is land use. And, and it's the issue which people are really seem to struggle to get their heads around. And while as environmentalists, we're very good about talking about greenhouse gases, um, talking about pollutants, um, talking about water use, we're really, really bad at talking about land use. And yet land use should be right up there as one of our top environmental metrics. How much land are we using? Because every hectare of land you use for an extractive industry is a hectare of land which can't be used for other purposes. You're shutting off possibilities by using land for one thing rather than another. And, and that's inevitable. You know, with any land use, you're going to be shutting off possibilities. But what that means is that if you're trying to protect wild habitats, intact habitats, we should be using as little land as we possibly can. And by far and away, the greatest danger to habitats worldwide is agricultural sprawl. Now, you know, the only time we really consider land use is when we're talking about urban sprawl. Right? And urban sprawl is, is a real problem. You know, you only need to go to Adelaide to see that. Um, uh, these very spread out cities um, swallow up a lot of land. Um, they're also much harder to service with public transport, with, um, with, with water mains and the rest of it. And so um, you, you've got much bigger infrastructure costs as well if you've got a sprawling city. I think uh, urban sprawl is bad for cities as well as being bad for the countryside. But the entire urban area of the planet, all the homes, all the businesses, all the infrastructure occupies 1% of the terrestrial surface of the planet. It should be less. You know, we should be able to do it in three quarters of 1%, but it's 1%, right? Agriculture occupies 38% of the surface of the planet, and, and much of the rest of that planet is um, desert, it's ice cap, it's rocky mountain tops, which you couldn't use for agriculture anyway. Only 15% of the planet is protected area of the terrestrial surface, uh, far too little. Agriculture, 38%. And so let's break that down. Um, Arable crops, so crops planted in the ground, is 12% of the surface of the planet. And of that, only 6 or 7%, uh, slightly more than half, is used to produce crops directly for human consumption. So 5 or 6% of the surface of the planet is growing crops to feed to animals, which humans then eat. Um, and, and so it's a very, very small amount growing crops for us. So hang on. What about that remaining uh, 26% of, of the planet? What's that? All that is grazing land. All that is producing cattle and sheep through 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 grazing on grasslands, on, on savannas, on pasture, on the rest. And that grazing land produces a very tiny fraction of our food. It, it's hard to tell exactly how much because so many animals are taken off the grazing land and finished in feedlots towards the end of their lives to fatten them up quickly because they grow slowly on, on grazing land. But the animals, and this doesn't capture the whole of it, but the animals um, who, who are grown entirely on grazing land produce just 1% of the world's protein across 26% of the land area. Um, and you know we're talking we're looking at the vast majority of the agricultural land area is, is used for that grazing. This is a fantastically wasteful land use. This is an extremely profligate way of using the world's most precious resource, which is land. And every hectare that that occupies is a hectare which could otherwise have been occupied by a wild ecosystem, by a rainforest, by a savanna, by a natural grassland. And the great majority of the world's species depend on wild ecosystems for their survival. 
In fact, Earth systems themselves depend on wild ecosystems for their survival. So the worst thing you can possibly do is to take away wild ecosystems on an industrial scale. Now, there was a very interesting paper published a couple of years ago, which said, what would happen if we did what all the Alan Savories of this world and the celebrity chefs and the food writers and all those other influences told us to do, which is to stop eating feedlot beef and switch to pasture-fed, grass-fed beef instead. You know, and this has become this great foodie thing. You should all be eating grass-fed beef. And now we can all agree we hate feedlot beef, right? It's, it's horrible. It's disgusting. It's appalling. But the only thing worse than feedlot beef is grass-fed beef. And the reason for that is the vast amount of agricultural sprawl it causes. And what this paper found was that if you switched away from feedlot beef to pasture-fed beef, in the United States, the area devoted to keeping cattle would need to rise by 270%. You would need to cut down all the forests. You'd need to drain all the wetlands. You'd need to water all the deserts. You'd need to degazette all the national parks. You'd need to demolish all the cities. And you would still be importing a lot of your beef from Brazil. It, 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 there just is not enough planet for us to be eating grass-fed beef or, or sheep. There's just not enough room for that. It's, it's, it's a luxury product. But because lots of people are eating it, that luxury product has caused environmental destruction across massive tracks of of the planet and now if we had lots of planets and no space for wild ecosystems on any of them yeah sure we could all eat grass-fed beef and lamb but we don't we, we 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 have this one planet and we have to look after it and the best way of looking after it is to minimize our land footprint and what grass-fed um, beef and lamb production does is to maximize our land footprint i think that would be will be incredibly hard, difficult for some people to hear. You mentioned before that there are people in government who are well-intentioned and believe they're doing the right thing. Yeah. I think the same thing can be said for people in the general public that are going to the grocery store and are buying grass-fed beef because they have been sold or told a different story to what you just walked us through. and. For them to hear you describe it as wasteful, I think might be news to them because they're being sold the very opposite here, George, that it's not wasteful. It's land that could not otherwise be used for anything else. This is wild grasslands that actually require animals, George, and we need to manage them the you know, in thousands, millions of years ago, there would have been big animals grazing these lands, helping keep the soil fertile. And in fact, these grass-fed beef systems are not damaging for the environment. If anything, they're making the soil more fertile. They're helping us grow more nutrient-dense plants. These are all the types of things that they probably have heard and are what have maybe motivated them to make the switch from intensive factory farmed beef, which, as you've just explained there, one, one of the, I guess, if we're going to say there's some pros to intensive uh, factory, uh, factory farm beef is that you can produce a lot more beef with less land. Um, but nonetheless, these people that are well-intentioned have been sold this idea that grass-fed beef is better for the environment and not just better than factory farmed beef but good for the environment period yeah so um yes you're quite right this, this, this is a story people have been told and people are very reluctant to let go of it but it's a completely false story in fact a fraudulent story um so let's start it from the beginning this idea that you couldn't do anything else with the land you know and it's this is this very extractivists of old testament idea that we have to be using all the land you know unless we're using it we're not fulfilling god's plan for the world um the idea of dominion of, of stewardship but actually there's something very good you can do with that land which is to leave it alone 
and to let natural processes take their course. And what we find when you do is that not only do you um, get much richer ecosystems if you reintroduce your wild herbivores and the rest, but you also get much greater carbon storage in those systems, particularly the above ground storage with the trees and other dense vegetation coming back or indeed much lusher grasslands and the rest. Um, as for the wild animals, which would otherwise be there, yes, absolutely, they would um, have um, impacts, um, but much, much smaller than those of the livestock today, because we are keeping livestock, um, even in these ranching systems, at far greater densities than um, wild animals we're living. In fact, if we tried to ranch at wild animal densities, you would quickly go bust because you just wouldn't have an, enough animals to 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 um, generate any income. Although most of these operations are subsidised anyway. Um, so, for instance, um, livestock warming. Uh, the greenhouse gas, uh, the, the heating caused by, by by livestock is is three times as great as that caused by the wild grazers, which would otherwise have been on that same land, just because of the much greater density and greater body weight of 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 those livestock on on the land. And there's been a fantastic amount of bullshit about well, buffalo, bison were living on this land before, um, and so. Um, um, they would have been producing just as much greenhouse gas emission. No, no sorry, it's about one sixth in 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 the US. Um, and and you know they were only on some of the land. They weren't weren't as nearly as universal as cattle were, and they had very different impacts on that land because they graze in in very different ways to the to the ways that cattle do. Uh, there's just so many misapprehensions here, stacked one on top of another. And this idea of livestock grazing being the sort of seat of innocence and purity, this goes back thousands of years. So, you know, people like me trying to say, well, this is what the science says, are battling not just against the PR of the livestock industry, you know, this very constant concerted and effective lobbying effort, but also against this massive weight of millennia of culture, which says that livestock farming is is a good and a pure thing and this goes back in the secular tradition to theocritus in the third century bc with his um, bucolics where he was looking back nostalgically he was living in the city of alexandria looking back to sicily where he was brought up and creating this sort of nostalgic idyll of the shepherds sitting under the trees telling stories playing their pipes having sex with each other not actually doing any work but this sort of idyll of 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 beautiful innocence and leisure um he created this very powerful story which was then picked up by virgil who moved the action to arcadia in the rocky heart of the peloponnese in greece um and expanded on this story in his eclogues um showing um, um uh, the shepherd as being the good ruler the sheep as being the good subjects of the ruler it sort of turns it into this big political parable um a similar tradition was then being pursued um in 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 um in the old testament um, which was written by the descendants of people who were herders, people like Abraham, whose flocks darkened the plains. And it was his descendants who, who were writing the Old Testament. These were the settled um, descendants of pastoral peoples. And right from the outset, it says um, herding animals is good and doing anything else is bad. So you know, that's Cain versus Abel. So Cain, a tiller of the ground, kills Abel, the herder of beasts, the beloved of God. You know, it's pretty clear from the outset what the agenda here is. And, and then, you know, later on, you know, the city is at, um is, is is this cursed place, Sodom and Gomorrah, or Nahum saying, Woe to the bloody city, it is full of lies and robbery, the prey departeth not. Um, and um and and this story is repeated and repeated and repeated that the virtuous life is the herding life. And then when Jesus comes along, he's simultaneously Agnes Dei, the Lamb of God, and the Good Shepherd. And he tells his disciples to feed my sheep. And the disciples become the first pastors. And pastor, of course, means means priest, in, uh, uh, but actually the Latin means shepherd. Pastor is, 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 is Latin for shepherd. And it's still the case in the Western church that the bishop's pastoral staff is in the shape of a shepherd's crook. And so this is 
deeply embedded this story in our lives. Um, and then the two traditions, the religious tradition and the secular tradition, were brought together in the Renaissance by people like Dante Boccaccio, um, Petrarch, um, and then um, picked up in England by Marlowe, by Shakespeare, by Spencer, by Herbert, um, and, and many others, um, to tell this, this um, um, story which sort of brings together the, the goodness embodied in it in religion and the goodness embodied it in the Theocritan tradition, um, to really embed this idea that, that the shepherd with his flocks or um, the cowhand with his cows is 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 the seat of virtue in our society and that is what's good and pure and that's absolutely central to society then this gets picked up in the 19th century or early 20th century in the US with the myths of the cowboy and the cowboy is the theocritan shepherd sleeping under the stars singing singing his songs um, um contemplating nature not until Brokeback Mountain having sex with other cowboys, but so so it wasn't till then that you got the sort of full Theocritan tradition completely recapitulated. Uh, but it's absolutely in that same mold. That's why you know it instantly resonated with people. The myth, and it's a complete myth. You know what what was really going on in the Wild West was utterly brutal and horrible and genocidal. But you know this myth is created. Uh, where the cowboy is a hero, just as in Theocritus, going back thousands of years. And this carries on today, in, like children's books, particularly, you know, books for very young children, pre-literate children. A huge proportion of them are about livestock farms. You know, not a livestock farm that you or I would recognize, a livestock farm with one pig, one cow, one cat, one chicken, one horse, one rosy cheek farmer. And they all talk to uh, talk to each other and live in harmony like a family. Um, and there's no indication of why the animals might be there or where they might be going. And so this this idea that, that extensive animal keeping is good for us and good for the planet and central to our culture, this is embedded in our minds at a very early age and reinforced through endless cultural tropes. So it's not surprising that it resonates with people. It's not surprising that people latch onto it and say, oh, yeah, that's good. Cattle grazing in the fields, that's what we want to see. That's a good thing. This is arguably the most destructive thing we've ever done to the planet. It is the principal cause of habitat destruction, the principal cause of the dispossession of indigenous people. It's been absolutely devastating. And yet, while we can see the dirt of fossil fuels, we cannot see the dirt of cattle ranching because we're blinded by those thousands of years of ideology. We've been able to tell ourselves a new story in other areas where there has been you know, a, a narrative for centuries. If we think about homosexuality and more recently uh, acceptance for homosexuality and same-sex marriages at least in in parts of the world and it feels like more and more people are opening up to that and we've been able to tell a new story and people have been able to change their views when it comes to this story and how deeply rooted it is based on your experience with speaking to people that perhaps oppose your views do we have enough time to tell a new story to to get people to change their views here or is this a case of not getting people to change how they see meat but just changing the way that we produce it well you put your finger on a crucial issue a couple of crucial issues one that we need to tell a new story and two we don't have much time i mean we are seeing the closing of the habitable space we, we've we have pushed and pushed planetary systems to such an extent that they're less and less able to support us and much of the rest of life on, on Earth. And we have very little time in which to stop doing that and to repair as much damage as we can before very large parts of the planet become more or less uninhabitable. And we, we're already seeing these heat shocks, and wildfires, the floods, the, the enhanced storms, all, all the rest of it making life very difficult for people in many parts of the world. And we're seeing um, um, uh, feedback loops kicking in, which it ensures that the um, problem exacerbates itself. Um, and so, yeah, we, 
urgently need to shift. And what we need to shift is not just current practice, but this whole weight of story, this massive great boulder of story, which has accumulated over these thousands of, of years. Now, uh, you know, our attitudes to homosexuality is a very good example of how things can change. Uh, you know, uh, the, the same with attitudes to women's control of their own bodies. You know, things can change. Obviously, they need to go much further in, in both of those cases. You know, there's still plenty of homophobia. There's still plenty of misogyny and patriarchy and the rest of it. But but enormous strides have been made, which would have been considered impossible a couple of generations ago. Some things have happened even quicker than that. Um, smoking or seatbelts, if you think about the, the shifts there, quite remarkable. I mean, when um, when I was your age, you know, smoking was just everywhere. It was, um, you know, in, in any public space, there were people smoking. Pubs were a fog of cigarette smoke. Even restaurants were, train carriages, buses. It was just, you were surrounded by this blue miasma of smoke everywhere you went. And nowadays, if you see anyone smoking, they're sort of hiding behind the bins, furtively um, dragging on their fag and sort of looking around with a sort of guilty, <laughs> guilty air to them, as if they're smoking behind the bike sheds at school and i think that that has been the most extraordinary and rapid change and and you could hardly imagine that we could have made such a big change so quickly and what we're seeing in these cases are tipping points um now all complex systems have tipping points society is a complex system society has tipping points um and and um and and society social tipping points can be reached much more quickly than tipping points in other systems because they're reinforced by um the very um sort of conformist nature of 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 human beings you know we don't want to be left behind most people side with the status quo whatever it might be and that's often a very bad trait you know we can side with the totalitarian regime because that's the status quo right but we could also side with an improving status quo so you know very few people are happy to be thought of as homophobic these days. You know, unfortunately, there are some. There's a sort of a bit of a resurgence of I'm homophobic and proud, or I'm misogynist and proud, or I'm racist and proud. Um, but you know, that's still a relatively small minority, and the great majority of people would be utterly mortified to be told that they were homophobic or misogynist or racist. Um, and you know, that has been a massive shift. And, and that shift has happened because you know, we don't want to be, we, we don't want to stick out. We don't want to be that that weirdo which no one wants to talk to. Um, and so the 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 sort of the tipping points which all complex systems have are in this case reinforced by that that sort of force of social conformity. And so we um we have every prospect of making very rapid changes in attitudes. Um, and what seems to be the case, uh, because there's been a, a, a range now of both um, observational and experimental studies, is that once 25% of people become permit committed to a new position, then everything flips. Then you, you get this very rapid social transition happening. And, and that 25% seems to be more or less the tipping point, because then people look around and say, oh, the wind has changed. I better tack round to catch it. I want to try and nudge us up to that twenty-five percent. And I and and when it comes to storytelling, at least Alan Savory's story, I still think that despite everything we've spoken about so far, I think some people will hear what you're saying. They'll understand the importance of producing more calories from less land, freeing up some land. Uh, I, I do want to try and come back to that because you you said that that can lead to richer ecosystems but uh, i think some farmers would perhaps wonder if it leads to richer people and uh, a, a a profitable uh, farming business but i still think part of the story that alan savory uh, shares that's compelling or i can see how it could be compelling is that not all land is equal and if we're talking about des desertified land in Africa, at least his view is that you can't treat that land the same as land in the UK. And 
it might be that, you know, and there was a question in the audience, I think someone stated that both of you seem to really appreciate the importance of biodiversity, but are coming at this from different angles. Uh, you more so with freeing up or sparing land so we can rewild it and not use it for agriculture. And, and Alan with changing the way that the land's being used and, and, and integrating his sort of grazing system as a way of, of increasing biodiversity. Is it possible that Alan and that the land that he's talking about, that desertified sort of barren land image that we all have in our mind, and we've probably seen photos of it, particularly in Africa, that the only way to really regenerate that land is to have some form of, of grazing practice where animals are kind of trotting on, on plants and are um, putting, you know, particular nutrients back into the soil. Yeah. So for, first off, you're absolutely right to say that, you know, we should look at different land differently. You know, there, there's, there's no one rule that you can apply uh, everywhere on earth, even within a certain category of land. So if you say, right, desertified land, we do this in all desertified. You, you just can't can't do it that way because there, there are major differences in soil types, major differences in climate, major differences as to why that land became desertified in, in the first place. Um, and so, you know, there is no one size fits all. I think that's totally fair to say. But the evidence that you can restore land by Alan's techniques is simply not there. You know, the onus is on him to demonstrate that the scientific evidence for his claims is there. And he just, the extraordinary feature of the debate, as I'm sure you noticed, was that he utterly failed to address the motion. In fact, he refused to address the motion. And, and I got pretty frustrated at times. Now, I thought we were supposed to be talking about whether ranching is is essential to mitigating climate change. And it's just he would not talk. In fact, at one stage, he just said, oh, let's forget about carbon dioxide, forget about methane. And he said, hang on a moment, that, that's what we're going to be talking about. And, and far from citing the science, you know, and I tried to stick rigorously throughout to the science, he just kept talking about this thing he calls oxidation. And he made this extraordinary claim that oxidation happens in dry environments, but not in wet environments. And say, sorry, what? What are you talking about? And, and he totally failed to explain what he meant by oxidation in this context. Uh, it certainly doesn't accord with any scientific definition of oxidation. Does he mean decay? Um, I mean, what, you know, it's it completely incapable of explaining that. Even after the debate, you know, I pressed him on some of this stuff. He couldn't define this term he used, but he just talked about it again and again. Oxidation, oxidation, oxidation. It reminded me of General Jack D. Ripper in Dr. Strangelove talking about bodily fluids. It was like this mantra. If you say it often enough, you'll persuade people. And so the problem in, in dry environments is oxidation. So, well, oxidation is something that happens everywhere. And in fact, in certain wet environments, it happens much faster than in dry environments. But what are you talking about here? And and the more I pressed him to say, where's the evidence for the claims that you're making, the more he just repeated these mantras about oxidation. In fact, he didn't even try to 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 produce any weight behind the case that 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 ranching can um can have the effects that he was saying. He just kept talking about this undefined concept of oxidation. It was an immensely frustrating debate. I mean, I, I got really annoyed by the end of it because I thought, you know, I've spent weeks preparing for this. You know, I'm making sure that I was completely up to date with all the scientific literature. You don't seem to have done any preparation for this debate whatsoever. You're just coming in with a bunch of mantras, reciting them like some religious creed. Um, and without really even making any effort to try to persuade people, it's like, what's going on here? Um, and it reminded me strongly of Brandolini's law or the bullshit asymmetry principle, um, which states that the amount of energy needed to refute bullshit is an order of magnitude bigger than that needed to produce it. But in this case, it was three or four orders, orders of magnitude bigger because of the amount of work I put into this. So, you know, the ball's in his court. And he won't even play it. You know, he, he, it, it's just like, it, you know, I'm not even going to bother to try to demonstrate my claims. Well, sorry, mate, but 
It doesn't work like that. If you don't demonstrate those claims, those claims do not stand up. It's as simple as that. I think in your book, you said that you 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 like Alan Savory as a person. In fact, he contacted you when you were ill once. People are besotted by by him that that follow his his story. And and I think it's the delivery, his calm delivery, and uh, his sort of the, the reiteration of of how connected he is to the land and and observation and sort of on the ground, you know, style approach. I think that appeals to a lot of people when they contrast that to in a lab. And it's this kind of, well, what do they know, <laughs> you know, versus this person who's on the ground. I think that's a mistake, but I can see how you could fall into that and discard true experimental science and and legitimate uh, science that's been conducted in this area. Uh, but having reflected on on the debate and the way that he kind of pushed the debate proposition to the side, are you still of the view that he is well-intentioned and sincere and just really believes what he's putting out there and is not a bad faith actor? Well, it's a, it's a good question, and, and it has passed through my mind. I can't see into his head. You know, I, I don't know what his motivations are, and I expect, like, with a lot of people, they're quite mixed up, you know, because... On, on the one hand, he might genuinely believe it. And at the same time, it's very hard for him now to backtrack, even if he ceases to believe it, because to backtrack, he would have to say, well, my whole life's work is actually based on bullshit. Um, and that's a very difficult thing for anyone to do, understandably. I mean, it's what, you know, it's what scientists are urged to do is to say, you know, if the evidence doesn't support it, you have to come clean about that. And you have to be humble enough to say, yeah, um, uh, uh, this line of inquiry hasn't led anywhere. Um, and I, however much effort I've put into it, I haven't been able to demonstrate this proposition. So the proposition is wrong. And you know, but that's a very tough thing for any human being to do. I mean, that is asking a lot. And it's massive credit to scientists that they're able to do that. You know, it's, it's quite an amazing thing that, that scientists um, are, are, are able to be so humble that they can just say, yeah, hands up, I got it wrong. And, you know, it's something which many more journalists should be doing, you know, and as a journalist, you know, I really try to do it myself. And on a few occasions, as you know, I've written an article saying, yeah, I was wrong about this. And, you know, you have to swallow hard to do it. You really have to screw yourself up to do it. It's uh, especially these days of social media, because, you know, while some people will say, well, fair play to you, mate, you know, kudos for, for putting your hand up. Other people say with all this jeering, you know, yeah, yeah, you wrong, you're you're a loser, you know, all this. It makes it all the harder. And especially with this whole, whole Donald Trump style now that we got, which is um, you know, that you've got to be right about everything, and anyone who's wrong is a loser. And you know, it just makes it it is a horrible, horrible state of public discussion we're in that that it makes it much harder to be humble. So you know, I'm not. I've got no animus against Alan. You know, and I still, yeah, I still like the guy. Uh, I find him very frustrating um, because you know he 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 won't even make an effort now to to justify what he's saying. He just repeats it and repeats it without any attempt at justification. So the debate was immensely frustrating. Um, but, you know, uh, and some of his followers fell away. You know, there was quite a lot of social media talk about how disappointed people were. This wasn't what I was expecting. I mean, the people I felt worse for were the farmers who come all the way from Scotland and Wales in some cases um, because he was their hero to listen to this guy. And I felt he just completely let them down. You know, I felt really bad for them. I spoke to a few afterwards, you know, and you could they were seething with frustration in just the same way as I was. Um, and I had a couple of livestock farmers wrote to me afterwards and said, look, you know, I was completely sold on the savoury idea, but having watched this debate, um, I think you're right. Which again, you know, fair play to them. You know, that is a difficult thing to say. You know, it requires humility. Yeah, sometimes we can fall into the trap of of seeing confidence as authority and credibility mistakenly versus versus the more nuanced detailed um 
you know, less absolute, harder to grab a hold of explanation. We've been discussing for over an hour and a half and going through all of these different yeah. principles. And, you know, there's a there's a lot to absorb when you, you know, when you if you want to go down that path. So I understand, you know, how someone like Alan Savory can build or attract a community. What about yourself? So it's been two months since the debate. In reflection, I mean, you shared before you you obviously had frustrations during it with the the way that Alan kind of moved the debate proposition to the side. But in in reflection, was there anything that Alan raised or any questions from the audience that prompted you to look at things differently? Are you less sure of your position here? Are you more sure? Well, that's what I was hoping for. You, you know, I mean, for me, and I know it sounds a bit perverse, but the joy of debates is being exposed to new perspectives, and and you know, to be shown not, not necessarily that you're you're flat wrong, Monbio, but have, haven't you thought about it this way? Shouldn't you be looking at it like this? And you know, what I want to come away from is. It, obviously, you want to win debates, but you know, actually, what I want to come away from is is that oh, that made me think. That made me want to look at something from a new perspective. Someone introduced some some new way of thinking, new new way of looking. Um, that to me is a very satisfying debate if if that can happen. But ah, oh, I mean, this was the most frustrating debate I've ever done in my life, and I've done a lot of debates. Um, you know, with people with whom I strongly dis- disagree, but often I've had a really good time with them. It's been it's been really interesting and fascinating, and we've disagreed in an interesting way. And I've come away thinking, yeah, well, he had a point about that. Yeah, I mean, I don't buy the whole story, but this bit, yeah, he was right about that. I've got to, I've got to look at that again. None of that in this case. It was just, I mean, it, the arrogance of it was what was so amazing to me you know a guy stands up and just says this is the way it is oxidation oxidation is the problem oh, forget about carbon dioxide forget about methane forget about the entire scientific canon this thing i'm calling oxidation which so too arrogant even to define that's what you've got to focus on and, and in in these environments you get oxidation and in these ones you don't and when you challenge him, him, him on it, he just repeats it and repeats it and repeats it. There was no attempt to argue. There was no attempt to debate. It was just repetition. So yeah, it was it was intensely disappointing. You know, especially all the time I'd put into that preparation, and you just come up with this. It's just wasted time. It was a complete waste of time. Um, yeah, I mean. There was one useful aspect in that you can refer people to it and say, "Yeah, this is your hero." See what happens when he's challenged. This this is what happens. And, and you know, when uh, people have watched that debate, you know, the very few of them would say, uh, yeah, what he's saying stacks up, you know, but that's the only good outcome. You know, what a debate should be is generally enlightening and entertaining. It wasn't entertaining either. It was just boring. Hey, friends, if you'd like to stay connected and reinforce the valuable insights from this show, let's connect on Instagram. You can find me at Simon Hill. That's at Simon Hill. I look forward to seeing you there. All right, let's dive back into the episode. Have you been challenged from a farmer's perspective on your stance on rewilding and using land differently? But before you mentioned, we we have this this mindset of domination, dominion, you know, extraction of calories from land, and you know, if you peel back the layers there to my understanding that's because of where the incentives lie yeah. so you know, if you extract more calories from the land then you can have a more profitable business and i think we can all agree that you know farmers deserve to to make a living and they're important to to society functioning um the people that produce the food that we get to enjoy and that sustains us um so if less land is being used to produce food and this land is is owned by farmers who are currently extracting calories from it to make a living to provide for their family how how are they compensated for that how do the incentives change so for a start the premise of that is completely wrong 
that um, farmers are, and ranchers do not make money from producing animals. They make money from public subsidies in, in, in rich nations. So if we take the UK, for example, um, the case I obviously know best, um, every sheep that a um, sheep rancher produces in the UK costs them £13. The net um, profit from that is minus £13. And the more sheep you produce, the more money you lose. Um, and the um, average uh, farming income from a hill farm in the UK is minus £16,600 a year. So how do they support themselves? Entirely through public subsidies. The average public subsidy for those hill farms is £33,000 a year. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's public money which is keeping them in business. And it's another of the many perverse subsidies that governments dole out. You know, we know that they give perverse subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. Well, they give massive perverse subsidies to the farming industry. And a study of subsidies around the world, and incidentally, there's um, it's, it's over um, half a trillion dollars a year is given in farm subsidies, show that only 1% of them have any environmental um, content at all. And when you drill into the, that 1%, a lot of it, actually, the environmental incentives don't work and can sometimes drive the opposite to the impacts that they're supposed to have. Uh, this whole subsidy system is a total catastrophe, but it's also our way out. Because if a, a, a farmer is dependent on subsidies for their income, you can change what you want those subsidies to do. And I'm not saying in most cases, just take the subsidies away. I'm saying repurpose those subsidies. So for instance, in the UK, where we have um, 4 million um, hectares of our hills being used for sheep farming, which produces just 1% of our calories, it's absolutely minimal amount. Very few people eat lamb and mutton in this country anymore. Um, uh, and yet, you know, this huge land area, as much land as we're using to grow grain, which produces the majority of our, our subsidies, is used to produce this tiny, tiny amount of, of lamb and mutton. That land can be repurposed. And the way you repurpose it is to say, we're going to carry on paying you the money, but we're going to pay you to do something completely different, which is to rewild that land. And in so doing, you will make more money because you're not losing £16,600 a year by chasing sheep over rain sodden hills. Um, in fact, you'll be able to keep a lot more of the subsidy money yourself because you're not, you haven't got this massive loss-making enterprise that you're trying to sustain. And at the same time, you are bringing back ecologically rich and carbon rich ecosystems in places which are now bowling greens with contours you know where everything has been shaved down to a few millimeters of grass by 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 these sheep that you you're losing so much money from what's not to like you know and it's it's not an economic issue this is it's it's much more of a cultural issue you know um if you if you change the economic incentives people will be very happy to take them but the barrier to that is, well, we're sheep farmers, we're ranchers, this is what we want to do. Just the way, same way people might say, we're coal miners, we're oil workers, this is what we want to do. And I, I understand that, and I respect that. But unfortunately, you know, there are certain industries which are pushing the planet to ruin. And we have to change the incentives to help people out of those industries and into much more benign ones. Um, and, and ranching is the first place I would start. So shifting these farmers from farmers to conservationists almost. But we're stuck at the moment in a bit of a bind because those incentives, they they don't exist. So what's, you know, for farmers listening right now, what are they supposed to do? I mean, look, it, I mean, for a start, lobby to change the incentives, you know, because it's, you know, governments all, always say, well, you know, we, we have to listen to the farmers and they do listen to farmers. I mean, farmers have a lot of political sway, far far greater than the size, the economic size of their industry. Um, and, you know, everyone, we should be listening to farmers as well as to everyone else. You know, it's not that we shouldn't be listening exclusively to farmers, but, you know, the farmers can lobby for improved systems. And in this country, actually, to some extent, they have been doing that. And and some of, uh, quite a few farmers now um, have, have um, uh, changed their practices in response to incentives, which they themselves have asked for. And 
perhaps the only benefit of Brexit, leaving the European Union in the UK, is that we're able to change the subsidy system for farming. Uh, because the common agricultural policy, the subsidy system in the EU, is one of the most destructive forces on earth. It's a massive perverse incentive for clearing land. And now we're able to design our own system, and the system is not perfect, but it's a lot better than the common agricultural policy, and it is, in fact, incentivizing people massively to reduce their animal farming um, in some places and to rewild their land instead. So it's happening, and it's happening pretty quickly here. And, and I would urge farmers to press their governments for changing the incentive system in, in similar ways. Because, you know, a farmer is a land manager, you know, and you can manage that land to do different things. And one of the ways you can manage that land is to optimise it for nature. Is and and particularly bringing back species which are either missing or 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 or, or very endangered on that land, um, um, enhancing their chances of survival, bringing back habitats which have been greatly depleted. All these are now you know among the key tasks that humans are faced with in the twenty first century, and just producing more and more and more meat. That is actually not a task we should be we, we should be attempting in the 21st century. Um, you know what we need to do in general is to switch away from animal-based diets, and if we do so, we will free up loads of land. We will massively reduce the carbon intensity of our diets. Um, we we will be able to live much more lightly on the surface of the planet. I think that's part of the story that's really important. Is <laughs> what is that image? of rewilding what does that look like you know it, it, it that can be a very beautiful image to think about what freeing up uh, you know incredible amounts of land can actually do from an ecosystem perspective and and bringing back you know species that had previously been on that land and um, helping endangered species flourish again all of those things I, I think are clearly important parts of telling a new story does this environmental degradation, um, devastation, really, and story that grass-fed beef is is a, a part of the solution? Does that ever cause you personal stress or or anxiety, George Monbiot, as as the human? Yeah, it it, it really does. I mean, I can't. It, it really does. I can't. I can't detach myself from the impacts I see around me. I mean, I. You know, I've been a um, a naturalist since I was a very small child. Apparently, according to my mum, even when I was in my pram, I would follow birds around my eyes all the time. I was absolutely fascinated. And to see the scale of the destruction of the natural world, you know, not, not just from ranching, but from all the other impacts which we impose on it, it's heartbreaking. I, I can't pretend it doesn't get to me. It gets to me very much. Um, it's um, and and the fear I have for future generations. I, mean, I don't care about myself anymore. I'm 60 years old. Um, yeah, I've had a great life. Um, if I dropped dead tomorrow, it wouldn't matter. You know that that's not the important thing. But you know, when I think of young people today, and sometimes they write to me. You know, I've had heartbreaking letters. You know, I had one from a person saying, "I'm 14 years old. Are you saying there's no hope for me? Are you saying that that?" Um, you know, I've, I'm not going to be able to lead a good life because of planetary degradation. And it's very hard to answer that because actually that's what all the pointers are showing. But I don't want to be able to, I don't want to have to say to that kid, yes, yeah, um, you know, you can't expect anything good to happen in your lifetime. You know, and that's why I fight. That's why we, we have to do everything in our power to prevent environmental breakdown from happening. I want to finish with a question that I've been asked from others and and I often ask myself too. Just interested to hear your thoughts here to to sort of close out this episode. Why do you care so much about all of this? You know, if climate change wipes out humans, the the planet will still be here. It will regenerate. Why why stress yourself out during your lifetime? I mean, if this doesn't matter, nothing matters you know uh, i get upset reading in the newspaper about a baby dying you know but if we're talking about billions of people dying all the babies dying 
you know, that has to be many, many times more upsetting than one baby die. Um, I also know that human beings aren't going to go down without taking almost everything else about this wonderful planet with them. You know, if we trigger a mass extinction, you know, we'll be among the last survivors. We'll be there with the rats and the cockroaches. There'll be a few human beings left, but we will have wiped out all the other beautiful creatures, the tigers, the whales, the uh, rainforests, everything as we fight for our own survival. Um, you know, I don't want it to come to that either. Uh, that there are so many reasons to care. There's there's eight billion human reasons to care, and then there's billions of other natural reasons to care as well. And if we cease caring, we give up on ourselves. We give up on humanity. Yeah. Amen. Let's leave it there. I think that's a perfect way to close this out. Thanks, George. Appreciate all your work. I certainly hope that you're alive for many, many more years because we need all of your hard work in this fight. Um, remind people how they can connect with you online, how they can stay up to date with all of the incredible work that you're doing. Oh, thanks, Simon. Um, well, I, I write a column for the Guardian newspaper, a weekly column. Um, I I also put all everything up on my archive on my website, which is monbeer.com. Um, I've got a Twitter account, a Threads account, um, and various books. The, the most recent one, which covers the stuff that we're talking about, is, is Read Genesis, Feeding the World Without Devouring the Planet. Thanks. Brilliant. We'll put all of that into the show notes. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, really appreciate your Thank time you, today and all Total the incredible pleasure. work you're doing. Thanks. Thank you. There you have it, friends. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did and want to stay up to date with future episodes, be sure to hit that subscribe button on YouTube and follow on Apple or Spotify. Finally, thank you for showing up and the effort that you're making to take control of your health. I look forward to hanging out with you again in the next episode.